either before or after he crushed it. So I had better say something more specific. A program is free software if it gives you, the user, the four essential freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code of the program and then change it to make it do whatever you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor. That's the freedom to redistribute exact copies of the program when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. So if the program gives you all four of these freedoms, then it's free software. Because the social system of the program's distribution and use is an ethical system, one that respects your freedom and your community. But if one of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, then it's proprietary software. Because the social system of its distribution and use is unethical. So the difference between free software and proprietary software is not a question of what the code does. Rather, it's a question of the social system that the users of this program have to live in. Either it gives them freedom or not. Either it's ethical or not. So, to develop and release a free program is a contribution to society. How much of a contribution, that depends on all the details. But at least it's being given to society in an ethical way. But, a, to develop a proprietary program is not a contribution, it's an attack. The use of a proprietary program is a social problem. The program operates as a trap, inviting people to give up, to give up their freedom and become users of the program. If the program has any attractive features, those are the bait for the trap. But users who value their freedom will refuse to fall into the trap. So, to develop a proprietary program is not a contribution to society, it's harm to society. It's better to develop nothing at all than develop a proprietary program. And thus, the aim of the free software movement is that all software be free, so that all users will be free. <clears throat> but what makes these four freedoms essential? Why define free software this way? Each freedom has a reason. Freedom two, the freedom to help your neighbor, the freedom to redistribute exact copies, is essential on basic moral grounds. So you can live an upright ethical life as a good member of your community. If you use a program without freedom too, you are in danger of falling into a moral dilemma. This could happen at any moment. Whenever your friend says, that program is convenient, could I have a copy? At that moment, you would face the choice between two evils. One evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. The other evil is to refuse your friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. Being in the dilemma, you ought to choose the lesser evil, which is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. What makes this evil the lesser? Well, if you can't avoid doing wrong to somebody or other, it's better to do wrong to somebody who deserves it because he has acted wrong. 
We can assume that your friend is a good friend and a good member of your community and normally deserves your cooperation. Of course, sometimes it's good to cooperate with people even if they're not such good friends or such good members of the community. Maybe that way they will become more helpful. By contrast, the developer of this proprietary program has deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community, deliberately tried to divide you from your friends. So, if you can't avoid doing wrong to your friend or the developer, do it to the developer. However, being a lesser evil does not make it good. It's never good to make an agreement and break it. Not even when the agreement is inherently evil, like this one, and keeping it is worse than breaking it. Still, breaking it is not good. And if you give your friend a copy, what will she have? She will have an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program. And that's something rather nasty, almost as nasty as, a, as an authorized copy would be. So, once you have fully understood this issue, what should you really do? You should make sure that you never fall into this dilemma. But how? I know of two ways. One is, don't have any friends. <laughs> That's the method implicitly suggested by the proprietary software developers. The other method is, don't use this proprietary software. If you don't have a copy, you don't have to worry what you would say when your friend asks for another copy. That's my solution. If somebody offers me a program under the condition that I promise not to share it with you, I refuse it. I say my conscience does not allow me to accept that condition. It would be a betrayal of my duty to my society. So take that nasty program out of here. I reject it, and you should reject it too. And we should also reject the propaganda terms that the proprietary software developers use to demonize helping your neighbor. Terms like piracy and theft when they are applied to sharing. When they say that people who share are pirates, what do they really say? They're trying to say that helping your neighbor is the moral equivalent of attacking a ship. And nothing could be more false than that because attacking ships is very bad, but helping your neighbor is good. So don't call it piracy. Don't call those people pirates. And every time somebody uses those propaganda terms, explain why they're false. When somebody asks me what I think of piracy, I say, attacking ships is very bad. I, I am refusing to fall into their trap of accepting that term in the usage they want to make. And when they ask me what I think of software piracy or music piracy, I say, I don't think it exists. As far as I know, when pirates attack, they don't use computers, they don't do it by playing musical instruments badly, they use arms. In any case, this is the reason for freedom too. The freedom to help your neighbor. The freedom to redistribute exact copies of the program. Essential on fundamental moral grounds. Freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, is essential for a different reason. So you can control your computing. There are proprietary programs that restrict in their licenses the running of the authorized copies. That's obviously not control of your computing. 
So freedom zero is essential. But it's not enough. Because that's just the freedom to either do or not do whatever the code of the program actually permits. Which means that the developer continues to impose his decisions on you about how you can use the program, not through the license, but instead through the code. So to control your computing, you need freedom one also, which is the freedom to study the source code and then change it to make the program do what you wish. This way, you decide what to do with the program instead of letting the developer decide for you. And if you don't have freedom one, you can't even study the program to see what it's really doing. You can't tell in many cases, if it has malicious features to spy on you or to attack you like back doors. If it has malicious features to restrict you, that you won't see because you won't be allowed to do things. But you can't change them, so you're stuck with them. You see, when the users don't have freedom one, the developer can impose malicious features on the users and the users are stuck with it. That's why they do it so often, because they have the power to get away with it and make it stick. Now, not all proprietary software developers implement malicious features. At least I suppose they don't, they don't go through so. I don't know. Uh, but the developers are all human, so they make mistakes. The code of those programs has bugs. And you can't fix the bugs either. So the user of a program without freedom one is just as helpless facing an accidental error as facing an intentional malicious feature. If you use a program without freedom one, the freedom to study and change the source code, then you are a prisoner of the software you use. Now we, the developers of free software, are human too, so we also make mistakes. But if you come across an error in our code, or anything in our code that you don't like, you are free to change it, because we did not make you a prisoner. We can't be perfect. We can respect your freedom. But freedom one is not enough because there are millions of computer users that don't know how to program. They're not capable of exercising freedom one, which is the freedom to personally study and change the source code. But even for programmers like me, freedom one is not enough because there's so much software in the world. In fact, there's so much free software in the world that nobody 